Hi, everyone. Hi again. In Ray Franz, this is part four of his first chapter, Price of Conscience. Ray says, this is, I believe, one of the strange features of our time that some of the most stringent measures to restrain expressions of personal conscience have come from religious groups once noted for the defense of freedom of conscience. The examples of three men, each a religious instructor of note in his particular religion, with each situation described occurring in the same year, illustrate this. One, over the past decade, wrote books and regularly gave lectures presenting views that struck at the very heart of the authority structure of his religion. Another gave a talk before an audience of more than a thousand persons in which he took issue with his religious organization's teachings about a key date and its significance in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The third made no such public pronouncements. His only expressions of difference of viewpoint were confined to personal conversations with close friends. Yet the strictness of the official action taken towards each of these men by their respective religious organizations was in inverse proportion to the seriousness of their actions. And the source of greatest severity was the opposite of what one might expect. Hmm. The first person described is Roman Catholic priest Hans Kung, professor at Tübingen University in West Germany. After 10 years, his outspoken criticism, including his rejection of the doctrinal infallibility of the Pope and the bishops, was finally dealt with by the Vatican itself. And as of 1980, the Vatican removed his official status as a Catholic theologian. Yet he remains a priest and a leading figure in the Catholic University's Ecumenical Research Institute. Even students for the priesthood attending his lectures are not subject to church discipline. The second is Australian-born Seventh-day Adventist professor Desmond Ford. His speech to a layman's group of a thousand persons at a California college in which he took issue with the Adventist teaching about the date 1844 led to a church hearing. Ford was granted six months' leave of absence to prepare his defense, and in 1980 was then met with by a hundred church representatives who spent some 50 hours hearing his testimony. Church officials then decided to remove him from his teaching post and strip him of his ministerial status. But he was not disfellowshipped, that is excommunicated, although he has published his views and continues to speak about them in Adventist circles. The third man is Edward Dunlap, who was for many years the registrar of the Seoul Missionary School of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead. Also a major contributor to the organization's Bible Dictionary, Aid to Bible Understanding, and the writer of its own only Bible Commentary, commentary on the letter of James. He expressed his difference of viewpoint on certain teachings only in private conversation with friends of long standing. In the spring of 1980, a committee of five men, none of them members of the organization's governing body, met with him in secret session for a few hours, interrogating him on his views. After over 40 years of association, Dunlap was dismissed from his work and home at the international headquarters and disfellowshipped from the organization. Thus, the religious organization that, for many, has been a symbol of extreme authoritarianism showed the greatest degree of tolerance toward its dissident instructor. The organization that has taken particular pride in its fight for freedom of conscience, conscience showed the least. Well, that sure is ironic, because I really? do recall when, when I was studying with the Witnesses, they made much of the fact that they had been champions of free speech ever since the First World War. Yeah. And they even had a little booklet that they were still distributing at that point about their triumphs in, mm -hmm. the, in the courts of, of America. 
but in, it's the, pre- pretty in the World War II generation and beyond. If if you can't have freedom to disagree with them, right? If you're part of their group. Well, what, what of course they weren't telling me at the time was that this new disfellowshipping, shunning policy had only just started about well, twenty years before that, mm. and that we know if we've followed the history of the organization for the last fifty years that it's only got worse. There was a brief period of repentance mm-hmm. from their strict shunning policy, and then they went right back to something worse, till now it's just total. So mm-hmm. the irony mm-hmm. is that the organization they criticize the most in their literature, and have, have forever, the Roman mm-hmm. Catholic Church, is now far more tolerant of diverse opinions yeah. than you so are. So they don't really believe in freedom, and freedom of worship, or freedom of, of speech. Mm-hmm. So our link is uh, to a, a later chapter in this Crisis of Conscience book where uh, Ray is talking about group think and gossip and apostasy at the very top of the watch there. So I thought to bring in a, a book I had read recently when I started doing these videos by Jerry Gladson, who was a Seventh-day Adventist teacher mm-hmm. uh, in one of their institutions who was treated as badly as Ford here, but obviously the Adventists don't treat treat their dissident teachers nearly as badly as the Watchtower does. Mm-hmm. So Jerry Gladson's uh, memoirs supplied a few parallels to what Ray is talking about later in a later chapter of this book. Okay. See you next time.